How many of you guys got that cold brew this morning? I got the caffeine jitters up here, guys. It is hitting me hard. I can feel my heart just like warm and palpitating. I'm so glad you made it. My name is Drake. I'm the pastor here. If you're in person or online, we're glad to have you here. If you're a first-time guest with us, just want to let you know that you are loved, safe, and welcome here at City Church. We hope this place feels like family for you. We exist to help people find their way to God from where they are, and so that means no matter where you're walking in on your spiritual journey, our desire is to meet you where you are and help you take some next steps. So really glad you are here. Today, we are wrapping up our like third 13-week series on the Holy Spirit. You guys excited? It's the last one, last one. So next week, we're going to kick off a mini-series leading into Christmas Eve uh, on, on the Christmas story, and so really excited for that as we walk through the tail end of December. But today, I'm so pumped for what God's going to do and what he has for us. So thank you for being here. I got a couple of quick housekeeping things before we get into the message today. And so uh, really fast, just want to say thank you to everyone who came for the night of worship and prayer on Friday night. But let's put our hands together for all that God did that evening. Again, we say it often that prayer is our first response, not our last resort. And so a lot of what God is doing in and through this community, we believe, is because we seek God first in prayer and we're experiencing him in power working in and through this community. So thank you for that investment. How was fasting over the last week? How, how'd you guys do? survive? Anybody get hangry? Not too bad, a little bit. Yeah, a couple of us. And, and so really grateful for the church just pressing into that discipline. Thank you guys for that, for those of you that have participated. Hey, I want to do a quick thank you to everyone who has been a part of our Here for Good campaign. This has been a, an annual campaign that we started last year toward permanence here in Boulder. We have a vision. City Church is three years old. And we have the opportunity to begin to dream about permanence in Boulder, that we don't, we don't want to just be a church in and for the city. We want to be a church here for good. You guys get the play on words. It's pretty creative. I didn't come up with it, but it's creative. And, and so the desire is that we have a, a space of permanence. And so with God's incredible favor and your generosity and the generosity of so many people, not only through the commitments starting this time last year, but then throughout the, the entire year, people giving those commitments, City Church has raised half a million dollars toward permanence here in Boulder. Can we give God a hand for that and you for generosity? It's absolutely amazing what God has done in and through this community uh, and through so many partners outside of our church to get us toward this goal. And so we're at the end of that campaign, and I just wanted to celebrate. And so right now, we, we don't own this building, and again, the vision was not for this building necessarily, but, but for permanence long term. And so our goal right now is to purchase this building, but whether it's this building or, or God has a plan somewhere else, the long-term goal is permanence. And I was talking to one of my coaches earlier this week, and, and he was like, you raised how much? And I'm like, I know, it's crazy that God has done that. But um, it still doesn't put us at a place yet where we can just like, write a check and own this place. And so while, while we didn't necessarily raise the $4 million that, we, that we need to purchase the property, it's a massive win. And so we just want to say thank you to everyone that has been a part of that. And I believe it postures us for whatever God has next. My family and I, we invested heavily and sacrificially like many of you did, gave more than our cars are worth in order to be a part of that because we felt like God wanted us to do that. That's not bragging. That's just letting you know that we will never ask you to go somewhere we're not willing to go ourselves. And so I just want to say thank you again because I believe that every amount of investment that we have made is going to be for the kingdom and what God's going to do through that. So one more time, put your hands together for all that God did there. Super amazing. And I'm so excited to introduce, the, for the very first time ever, our City Church Christmas offering. Who's pumped about it? <laughs> like, what is it? I'll tell you. Don't worry. Our City Church Christmas offering, this is the very first time we're doing it. Um, and again, we're never going to ask you to go somewhere we're not going ourselves, but in a season of generosity, in a season specifically infamous for uh, this tagline of consumerism, the invitation for you and I is could we, as a family of Jesus followers, choose to get, go against the cultural current that we see ourselves in and invest in the kingdom continually through generosity? And so the City Church Christmas offering is going to be an invitation to give above and beyond our regular giving toward Boulder, the West, and the world. And to be clear, uh, this has been birthed out of a desire. Everything that this Christmas offering has a goal of going towards, we would do yesterday if we had the existing internal budget. Does that make sense? So we just didn't like make something up in order to have a year-end giving campaign. But these are things that we would do internally if we had the budget, and we are incredibly blessed because of your generosity already, but there's so much more we could do for the kingdom, and so I want to share with you our goal for the City Church Christmas offering between now and December 31st is to raise $10,000 that will impact four unique initiatives toward Boulder, the West, and the world. And so let me share those with you just briefly. Our first effort is through this offering. We want to double our church planter and missionary support for all our existing partners. 
That's pretty awesome. So right now, we have four church plants we're investing in, two campus ministries, three missions uh, 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 planting agencies overseas, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some because those numbers are just relative in my mind. We're also getting ready to send out our very own Billy and Gina to somewhere else around the world that we're not to say, allowed to say publicly online. And so we, our goal through this offering is we already are supporting all of them financially on a monthly basis, but we would like to double all of their support for the year 2023. And so, uh, again, that's part of this $10,000 goal for the City Church Christmas offering is doubling all of the support for our, our existing church plants and coming missionaries. In addition, we're going to fund some additional outreach events in 2023, so we have a lot of awesome events that we do throughout the year. Think like uh, community nights and, and uh, happy hours and things like that where we're meeting people where they are and creating spaces that are safe for people to come and engage in community, and so some of those funds are going to go towards that. Another one, this is super cool, you, hopefully you, you know this about our DNA, that we're not just about City Church and what is happening here, but we're about the Big C Church and God's kingdom in Boulder, so we regularly pray and celebrate all of the other churches that love Jesus and are sharing Jesus and are living on mission alongside us here in Boulder, and our friends at the Well Church, they are, over the last decade, some of you guys know these stats, 39 out of the last 40 churches that have been planted in City Church over the last decade no longer exist. 39 out of the last 40 churches that have started in Boulder have closed their doors over the last decade. The only church out of that list that's still here, outside of us and now Pinewood, that, that have been planted since then is the well. <laughs> so when we moved to Boulder to start City Church a couple of years ago, we leaned heavy into them, and they've had a massive amount of investment in the culture and the leadership of City Church to learn how to love our city well and engage and make disciples. And they bought a building last year in South Boulder. Let's go, God, for that. And their church raised $4 million toward it. It's amazing. <laughs> Super cool. And, uh, and so their goal was to be in that building by Christmas Eve. And like all things in building and like all things in Boulder, uh, things never work out in the timeline that you're after. And so they are up against a wall. They've got a few expenses that have come up that they are just tapped out beyond their capacity to do internally with all of their giving. And so they reached out to all the local churches in the area saying, hey, here, we've got a little bit of a gap for some of the development and things that we didn't see coming. And they're asking us to help them get in this building. And so City Church is going to give toward that initiative because we're about the kingdom and not just us. You guys with me? on that. And so that's what some of this offering is going to. You can put your hands together for it. It's super awesome. And we're grateful to have a, a part of that. And the last thing is we're going we're gonna to take some of this offering and have an increased investment in our existing staff team in 2023 so we can see the mission of City Church move forward continually. And so let's put our hands together for our incredible staff team. Man, they work really hard and we want to we wanna bless them for that. Um, and so again, our goal for the year between now and uh, uh, December 31st is $10,000 toward this Christmas offering and it's going to fill in gaps for things that we would do yesterday if it was in our, in our internal budget. And so here's my invitation for you. Um, number one, I just want you to reflect. Reflect on the impact that God has had on your life through City Church, and I want you to look ahead with us to where our collective impact as a church is going, right? Remember why we exist, to help people find their way to God from where they are, and so everything is about mission for us. And then I want you to pray, just like my family's doing in my journal this morning. I'm praying, all right, God, how do you want me to join you in what you're already doing? How do you want my family to be generous toward this initiative? And so we believe that God will, will reveal his heart for generosity as we seek him, right? We say that a lot here at City Church because of our radical generous disposition. We're managers, not owners of all that we have. And so my job is to ask God what he wants me to do and then to be obedient in that space. And the last thing is just an invitation to invest between now and December 31st to plant a seed, a plant a seed of generosity in the kingdom as we move into 2023. You guys pumped about it? I'm pumped about it. So thank you so much. We'll celebrate all that God's going to do through it ahead of time. Come on. And last but not least, because we love to celebrate all that God is doing around the world, I have the privilege today of introducing one of our friends. Her name is Gabriella from Overland Mission. So Gabriella, come on up here. You guys put your hands together for Gabriella. Gabriella's been at City Church for a little while. Some of you might know her, some of you might not. Uh, she's an incredible young lady that's been serving God all over the world. And so she's going to share a little bit of her story and a little bit about the invitation from Overland Missions. So you guys give your hands together for Gabriella. Good morning. Some of you guys may already know me, but I'm an expedition leader with Overland Missions, and my job is to connect the local church to spread the gospel to the most neglected and unreached people groups of the world. This past summer, I was leading an expedition in Zambia, and my team met a woman named Janet. She's a single mom who was just living in hopelessness and unforgiveness and bitterness. 
and was return and was going to witchcraft and other idols in order to fill this hole inside of her heart. When I met her, I just had a deep compassion for her, and our team went and visited her um, every day throughout the week and just talked to her and showed her the love of Jesus and preached the gospel with her multiple times in multiple different ways. She ended up opening up to us, saying how much unforgiveness and bitterness and things that she was going through. And after accepting Jesus as her Lord and Savior, she repented of all idols and all witchcraft and even burnt all her charms in front of us. And the next day, she came over to our camp and wanted to talk to me. And she's like, Gabriella, I want to know more about the Word of God. I want to know more. Like, how, how do I do more? And I... Um, you know, was talking to her for like hours, just telling her everything um, that I had known and answering all her questions. And then I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that she's going to be a minister in this village and that I needed to tell her that. And so when I told her that, she just started crying and she said, the night that you told me that, like the night that I gave my life to Jesus, the Lord spoke to me in a vision or in a dream that I would be a minister in this village, but I had no idea why would he why would he do that? I, I've done all these sins, and I'm like, you're a new creation in Christ, all the things like that. And then I felt also the Holy Spirit tell me to give her my Bible, and she spoke really good English, and she was able to read it. And just tr- uh, tears of thankfulness just coming over her face. Never f- will forget that moment. And six months later to this day, I'm in contact with our long-term missionary in that specific village. And he's been telling me about um, all the Bible studies that she's leading with other women. She's speaking at churches. She's counseling other women who have gone through the exact same thing that she's going through that are also are single moms and the father abandoned them. And she is a completely different person. She's so full of joy. She's so full of thankfulness. And it's like night and day. And that's what happens um, from these expeditions. So in Zambia, it's a nation, like they consider themselves Christians because they've heard of Jesus. And for the past hundred years, hundreds of missionaries have, con- have come there and have preached the gospel. But the one thing that is, has been missed in a lot of these um, be- people who have come is that they're not making disciples. They're coming there for a week. They're sharing things which are great, but then they leave. And so there's churches and pastors, but they don't even know the gospel. They don't have Bibles. They don't, they just know like maybe three basic things. And so when we come there, yes, we're preaching the gospel for in short-term trips, but we also have long-term missionaries creating sustainable long-term relationships to disciple them and to raise them up to be who God has called them to be and empowering the local church and the local leaders in that area to create a viral move of God. And so this coming summer in June, I'm leading a short-term two-week trip to Zambia and want to invite you to come and join me. We're all called to the nations in some capacity. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So will you guys come with me? I have a table in the back um, that you guys can come and talk to me, ask any questions in the lobby. And if you have even the slightest of interest, just come and we can talk more about it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Gabriella. Hey, love her heart. Uh, she has some crazy stories, uh, and she's just a normal person who loves Jesus that is sharing that same love around the world. Very similar what they're doing. What we love about what they're doing on the ground uh, through Overland is connecting, connecting it to local effort, and so not just the heroes from the states that come in, feel good about ourselves, and leave, but rather actually making an effort of coming in, being a part of what God is already doing, and then partnering, knowing that what's been done on the ground continues to work after the fact. And so this is very similar to what we do uh, in Central and South Asia and other parts of the world. And so thank you for sharing, Gabrielle. Let's put our hands together one more time for her. So good. Okay, you guys ready to get into the text today? We're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, 3, and 4 today. If you want to uh, get there on your phones or the Bibles and the seatbacks in front of you, I'm going to have some stuff on the screen. I'm also going to have a couple of uh, big chunks of text I'm just going to read uh, alongside with you today. But here's the question that I have, kind of Christmas season, ending the series, going into our Christmas series. How, how many of you are like full of, of the Christmas joy or at least Christmas eggnog? 
which is kind of the same thing. How many of you guys like eggnog, anybody? Who hates eggnog? Makes you just, okay, cool. So we'll fight afterwards, have a battle. Um, Christmas eggnog brings joy, friends. Okay, so, so here's, here's where my mind has been sitting lately is I think everyone in the real life, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, everyone wants joy. Like, I hate being joyful, said no one ever. Now, I get it, maybe Christmas card, like, like some extreme version of it that feels fake, and put, like, no, we're not after that, but like that deep joy that's connected to purpose, kind of despite your circumstances, everyone wants that, right? And, and, and you've all been around people that have it, right? And you're like slightly irritated with them, a little annoyed that they have it, but also you want it on the inside, you know what I'm talking about? And, and so, have you ever found that you've also just like misplaced your joy? Like, like genuinely, you're like, where did it go? <laughs> like, it should be here. It's Christmas time, and, and where is it? I'm just stressed and busy, and there's anxiety, and life is happening. Where's my joy? Um, and, and if you're married, or you have kids, or you have roommates, or friends, coworkers, right? None of the people in your life are going to be mad if you are more joyful this week, right? And so I want to lean in today to what does it mean to press into a life full of joy as we wrap up this series on what the Holy Spirit has been doing. What's ironic about this conversation, and I don't know your experience, so we can just speak to it for a minute, is that the church has been a place that, that many have experienced as, as full of people lacking joy. Have you, guys, would you guys, have you guys ever had that experience where you're just like around a bunch of grumpy Christians and you're like, what is the deal? Like, why would you spend your entire life dragging yourself to grumpy church. I don't, I don't have a category for it. I think where that comes from is Jesus came to restore what, what he would call relationship with God. And then at times, our hearts, we kind of try to get our hands on it, and we move into this thing called religion, which is rather than God coming to us and making us new and love being the motive, religion is us getting to God, us working for God, us posturing our hearts to, to, to say, okay, can we be good enough? Can we be enough? Can we get God to actually maybe tolerate us or like us? And I think the grumpiness of Jesus followers, and I don't, even, I don't know if we would even call them that at that point, but that grumpiness comes from religion, not relationship. And so I don't know where you're walking in, but I think one of the categories, the differentiation between religion and relationship could be thinking about it like family versus business. So I don't know your experience with church and how you walked in today, but we use that language a lot, and it's not just surface level. Hopefully that language makes you feel good. It's intentional because it's how Jesus and the New Testament authors talk about what God is doing through the local church. And so I want you to think about it. What is business? When, when I show up in a, in a church community as, in, like a, as a business partner, the question is, how can I put the least amount of effort in to get the most out of it, like a business transaction? I want you to think about your family relationships. How would it be if you treated your family, your home, your extended family like business relationships? The least amount in to get the most out of it. Some of you are like, I have kids like that, <laughs> right? No, no, no. If, if, now, there are some dysfunctional families that operate like that, right? But you and I both know that a healthy, thriving family is not built on transactional relationships. Family shows up and doesn't say, what can I, what's the least amount in so I can get the most out of it, family shows up with the posture. How can I give? How can I help? How can I contribute? How can I love? How can I invest? And so it's the difference of, of a heart posture toward consumerism versus being a contributor. You guys tracking with me on this? I think these are the postures, family versus business, that leads to joy versus this kind of grumpy bitterness, kind of a lack of joy in our lives. And, and listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus in the room, I want you to know that you're invited into this family no matter where you are today. Today, but, but, it, but it's not just like come sit in the room and just get the byproduct from it. It's a family you participate in. And some of you have been attending City Church for a while and you have yet to take the step of participation. And I just want you to know you're missing out. You're missing out when you choose to, to, to hold back and just attend because what God is doing to this family is incredible and what God wants to do through you in this family, you don't even have a category for it. And so as we talk about this conversation today, I just want to invite you, what if I told you that as we lean into the text today, that there are some steps that you and I can take to genuinely, like the next five days of your week, live lives full of joy and purpose. Not manufactured, not Christmas season, wear a good Christmas sweater and, sweater and put on a good face, but genuine joy and purpose. You guys interested? Cool. <laughs> Like three of us, so we're going to go there. The rest of you guys, you can just hang out with us, okay? So how many of you love to give gifts? Anybody love to give? I, man, it's so much fun to give gifts. And you, you guys heard the saying that it's better to give than to receive? 
You guys heard that before? That's from Jesus, by the way. Um, and, and I think it's true. In fact, studies are coming out that have nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever, that people are happier the more that they give rather than consume. And so I'm so pumped about giving gifts. And like, we just had our team party. So those of you that, that, that have joined the team here at City Church and you're volunteering and you're in those spaces, we threw a big team party a couple of weeks ago. And we had these really cool beanies made as a gift just to celebrate. Keith is wearing one in the back. He's like, oh, I can't believe you just pointed me out. Everyone look online. Be jealous because you can't see. But these awesome beanies that we handed out to all of our team members, and they're super cool and swaggerific, and, and there's so much joy in giving to our team just to celebrate them. But the most joy I found was when this team member received that beanie. Oh, man. Mina, I don't know if that's joy or constipation, but she's got it, whichever one it is. And so... Will and Nate sent me that picture, and I'm like, that makes this whole thing worth it. And so, I, I don't know about you guys, but giving gifts, man, it's such a joy to give. And, and you might, you know, think about it. It's not complicated. Why? Because the more you give, the more joy you have. They're interconnected. And so the first thing I want you to wrestle with today is this big point, that God is a giver. I don't know your relationship, your posture, what you've been exposed to, because this is not always true of our experiences, but from the God of Jesus, God is a giver. He loves to give. In fact, the entire Christmas season is celebrating that God gave. And so I, I don't know, again, what, what your understanding is of this, but we don't have to beg God to give good gifts. It's his nature. It's his posture. He is a giver, not a taker. Other world religions, as you press into like what it means to have a relationship with God, God in those scenarios, he's a taker. The God of Jesus is a giver. John 3, 16, Jesus said that God so loved the world. He loved you and he loved me and he loved your neighbors, coworkers, extended family the bolder the west in the world, for God so loved Zambia that he gave. The greatest demonstration of God's love for us is not this tangible, you know, a verse in a Bible. It's the physical Jesus being born, living the perfect life you and I couldn't live, dying the death that we deserve, and rising again like you and I can't to offer us new life in relationship with God. Jesus said it this way, I came to serve, not to be served. So if that's the God of Jesus and that's the posture of Jesus, then why does it not always feel like that? Why does it seem like a lot of times the church is anything but generous and communities are any, anything but giving? Now, that's not true of this community. In fact, I think what, what God has done in and through City Church, we have an incredible amount of favor in our city. That City Church is known for being radically generous to demonstrate and reflect the heart of God. And so let me just run you through just a, a list so you can kind of process this with me. God gave us Jesus. It's the Christmas season, okay? So here we are. And, and with that, because Jesus is, is God in the flesh, God in a bod, by default, God is giving us himself. So rather than us drawing near to God, Christmas is a celebration of God drawing near to us. Whether you were, you were seeking him or not, whether you cared about him or not, God, just in spite of you and I, draws near to us. But it doesn't stop there. But because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, everyone who steps into relationship with him, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which has been the whole premise of the series. You guys tracking with me? And so all of this series, we've been walking through what this gift of God's Spirit living inside of us means. And, and at the early end of the series, we, we were dealing with um, God doing this this these gifts in and through us. Uh, we use the Greek word pneumaticos, if you remember a couple of, of, of weeks ago. It's like three months ago now, actually. But pneumaticos were like the stuff the Spirit does. So the Holy Spirit, not only do we have him living in us as Jesus followers, but then the Holy Spirit gives gifts. Number one, these pneumaticos, this overflow of the stuff the Spirit does in and through us. But number two, we talked about how there's another Greek word where we actually see, every time you see it in your scriptures, when you're reading like Ephesians 2 and 3 and 4 today, when you see that word gift, it's the word charis or, or charismata, and it is the space of, of a gift. And so we see these spirituals, the stuff the Spirit does, but then we actually see the Holy Spirit giving gifts to you and I as Jesus, Jesus followers. Why? He gives gifts so that you and I can be a gift. And so number, number two is that God wants to give you, just a premise today, God wants to give you. That you, you might not know this, but you are a gift. 
And you might have grown up in a home that said anything other than that. You might be treated currently in spaces that you don't feel that at all. And the beautiful thing about following Jesus is that our identity is set inside something much bigger than the circumstances and the people around us. But one of the things that should be coming out of the family of God is that people are speaking that same identity and reminding you this is who you are. This is your identity, even when your activity might look different, even when there's struggle, even when you drop the ball, even when you're not acting in your true identity and who you should be at your core because of Jesus. This is who you are. You're a gift, and you are gifted. Ephesians 2, Paul tells us, and you can look at it if you want, uh, in, the, in the Bible's in front of you, in your phone, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, ver- verses 8 through 10. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not on your own doing. You didn't earn it. It's a gift from God, not a result of works so that we can't boast, but rather we are his workmanship, or another translation would say his masterpiece created in Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. There's an incredible amount of purpose in who God says that you are. You are a gift, and, and, and you need to be reminded of that, and you need to be a reminder for others. One of the core functions that you and I can have on a weekly basis is just to look at people and remind them they are a gift. Now listen, you have gifts, you are gifted, but first and foremost, you are a gift. Today is a perfect example. Uh, our band is getting ready, and then some things catch on fire, figuratively speaking, and, and everyone has to pivot, and our team is super humble, and our production and band, they're working really hard to get ready for today. And can I just say, Christmas songs are crazy hard, just so you know. Like, you talk about the most stressful time of year. It's the most stressful. No, it's hard. It's so hard. And so they're working hard to pivot. And the best call is our bass player, Nicole, she, she just decides, hey, you know what? I'm going to step out so that the set can be a little more simple. And she stayed up all night practicing and got here early for practice. And she sets aside and puts her gift down. And she's just in the room. Where are you, Nicole? Hey, there you are in the back. And, uh, yeah, put your hands together for Nicole being amazing. And, and I told her this morning, I'm like, man, you're the perfect example for my message today because, because now that you're not using your gifts, don't forget, you're still a gift. Just sitting in the room, being here this morning, an encouragement in this family and community, using your personality, you are a gift. You guys tracking with me? How many of you guys have met my wife, Danielle? The, like married way up, right? How many of you guys know that she herself, she's just a gift, right? I mean, I mean like, I, I, like, just the person that she is. Like me, debatable, right? Somebody like, eh, I don't know. But her, like just being there. I walk in a room and everybody's like, where's Danielle? I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint. Uh, she's not here. Uh, uh, but Danielle, man, just her person, she's a gift. And, and, it's, and you can make a list of why. And that's true of every single one of you. But she's also gifted, isn't she? Those cookies, they're already gone in the lobby. Gone before you even get here. That voice... She's loving on your kids right now. I mean, she is gifted. Everything that looks beautiful here graphically design-wise, that's her. She is a gift and she's gifted. You guys tracking with me? This is true of you as well, that God looks at you and you are his masterpiece. You are a gift and you're gifted. And there's not another you on the planet. You are uniquely called and gifted by God Ephesians says, for a purpose. One of the things that brings about joy in our lives is when we attach it to purpose. And sometimes we get so busy and so distracted or so stuck on something much, much lower than what God has for us that we miss out on the joy of living out the purposes that God has for us. We say, we say it a lot here at City Church. Everyone is a tenant something. No one is a tenant everything. That's why we need each other. And so we want to we be a church that serves as a catalyst for you pressing in and using your gifts. Now let me be clear before we move on. Your gift is not your identity. You are a gift because of who God says that you are. Infinitely valuable before you ever did anything. But you are also gifted, and your gift is not your identity. Some of you have either been, been postured because of what you, a home you grew up in or the world you live in now, and in your mind and in your heart, all you can hear and all you can fear is, um, uh, feel is, I'm only valuable when, when I'm using my gifts, when I'm serving, when I'm contributing. And every time you find yourself in a space where you're not full of activity, depression just, just you just feel worthless. 
And so it's so important for, for, for the invitation from Jesus is that you find value not because of what you do, but because of who he says that you are. That you and I, as Jesus followers, our identity is found in Jesus. If you're not a Jesus follower in the room, this is one of the most compelling parts of making a decision to follow Jesus is that we don't perform for him to get us to like him, but uh, to, to get him to like us, but rather we receive this incredible gift of grace that we don't earn or deserve. He makes us new. He makes us alive. He forgives. He sets free, and then he empowers us to use this giftedness for him in this kingdom. It's amazing, but it starts in this reality that my identity is found in Jesus, and out of my identity is where my activity finds purpose. You guys tracking with me? This is why all the time we say it here at City Church, the priority of daily spending time with Jesus in silence, solitude, prayer, the scriptures, all those spiritual disciplines, why? It's to be with Jesus to be reminded of who you are and who he is and who we are in relation to him and to be formed by Jesus, to become like Jesus and to do what he did. But there's a flow that when we try just out of activity, we start giving out of an empty bucket and then it starts this cycle where we lose our joy and everything is attached to what we're doing. And so I just want to set you free from the reality that you are not what you do. You guys tracking with me? But do not take for granted that you are indeed a gift that out of that identity, there is an activity for you. So today's passage, Ephesians 4, you guys ready? Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Paul's going to talk about your gifting, and and we're going to wrap this up uh, uh, today in this series. But uh, first, I want to read this prayer for you, because because he connects the gifting to the answer of the prayer that he's praying for you. So check out Ephesians chapter 4. It's not on the screen. Um, I'll, I'll be there in just a second. But Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, this is 3. Ephesians 3, verses 14 through Uh, 21. Listen to this prayer. So he connects this to the gifting that the Holy Spirit has given us. Okay, check this out. He says in verse 14, for this reason, talking about the good news of Jesus, I bow my knees and I pray for you from every family, verse 15, in heaven and on earth, that according to the riches of his glory, that's God's goodness, that he might grant or give you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Imagine you go into Monday And you have this tangible sense that from God you are strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Right? That's what he's praying for you and I. So that, there's a purpose for it, Jesus or Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. That you and I, being rooted and grounded in love, he gives us the posture, the why, what we keep coming back to that we might have the strength to comprehend with all of God's family, this is verse 18, what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of God that passes all understanding. Isn't it interesting that he prays that you and I would have the strength to comprehend God's love for us? As in it's something that we lose easily. It's something we get distracted from. It's something we, we drift from. That Yeah, God loves me and it's out here somewhere, but it has no bearing on my Monday or how I treat my kids or how I show up to work, or, or what's going on in my mental thought processes. And he goes on, he says, man, I pray that you can know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, verse 19, and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That, that's a lot. I, I would love that in my Monday. In verse 20, he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to his power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. So all that Jesus wants to do in and through you, he's praying for this space that love will be the motivation and that through the Holy Spirit and through his family and through scriptures, we will grow into the people that understand God's love and that love informs our activity. We have a mission as a church. We exist to help people find their way to God from where they are. It's not just about us. If you're in the the family of God, it's a celebration. Thank God for that. But Jesus came for everyone. And part of the invitation is that we we, we freely receive and gladly receive the goodness of this season and what Jesus came to do, and then we freely and gladly share it with the world around us. And we can't do that if we don't have this. So the question naturally is how do we get it, right? Because like a prayer is great, and I think prayer matters, but he doesn't stop there. Check it out. Verse, uh, uh, chapter 4, and it'll be on the screen here as well, in verse 11, or verse 7 and 11. So he, Paul paints this picture of Jesus being not only, you know, cool, cute little baby Jesus in a manger, 
um, but also like Jesus, victor, and king. And so Jesus comes, he lives a perfect life like you and I can, he dies the death that we deserve, he rises again, and in that the scriptures teach that Jesus defeated as this conquering king, sin, those things that are disordered desires that plague us and pull us away from God, uh, sin, death, the ultimate enemy coming one day for all of us, Jesus overcame death and the devil, the enemy against our souls. Jesus is the conquering king, and he paints this picture. Think like Lord of the Rings, kind of, you know, an army comes in, conquers a city, and there's all of these spoils of war. You guys tracking with me? So Paul in Ephesians 4 is painting this picture of Jesus as the victor king with spoils of war, and as he's parading the enemy out of the city, and they're all in chains, sin, death, and the devil, Jesus is the victor, and he's giving gifts to men. You guys Tracking with me? So the spoils of war, he is now giving gifts. So in verse 7, he says, But to each one of us, grace or gifts have been given as Christ apportioned. So he's giving gifts. This conquering king is now giving gifts to his people. Okay? We, if you go back in the series, you can pick up kind of the conversation between 1 Corinthians 12 and now back here to uh, where we are in Ephesians 4. But what are these gifts? So how, how many people get the gifts? Just a few of us. The super special ones, the ones that sing really well, tech savvy, yeah. The one who make good cookies, like who gets them? Each one of us, in case you're wondering, that means each one of us, okay? It's the technical Greek term. And uh, verse 11, so Christ himself gave, what, what gifts were they? What did he give to each one of us? Individually, he gave different ones as he apportioned. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. This is what we call the five-fold gifts, or, or what Alan Hirsch calls the, uh, the, the, the capacities. So, so we talked about like receiving words of prophecy a couple of weeks ago. So there's receiving words of prophecy, and then now there is the gift of a prophet. You guys tracking with me? And so we, we argued a couple weeks ago that these are different. I'm going to just briefly walk you through this as we lay on the plane today. But here in this passage, he's saying these gifts are given for the purpose of building up the body. You can read this on your own time. Go out to Ephesians 4 and just read the rest of it. These gifts are given for accomplishing the very prayer that he prayed just, just a second ago. You guys tracking with me on that? So why? why? Why did these gifts work together? These gifts are meant to collectively in the body work together to build up the church, the body, the family of God, and to accomplish the mission in the world around us. If we want to be what Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what he did, and we don't do it alone. And so this is incredible space here of you and I pressing into these gifts. And here's the challenge, is in the world around us, one of the problems we see is that many churches lean into this as just a leadership capacity, and so then you'll see, you might walk into a church and, and, a, and a, a senior leader might have the gift of like shepherd and teacher. And we'll talk about that in a second. But all of a sudden, like it really feels like family and, and everyone in there, they love it and they feel known and loved and seen and they're really taught well, they're fed well, or whatever word, word you want to use. But it also kind of feels like it's hard to break into that crowd. And they also seem to be like internally focused rather than externally focused. You say, why is that the case? Because rather than the entire church being empowered, they, they've let one person take the reins and lead an organization. And Paul's saying all of these gifts were given to the whole body. And from the beginning, city churches tried to pet press into this. So today, I just want to let you press in a little more to your giftings and your capacity. So let me give you the breakdown of this. I'll give you a story, and then we'll wrap it up with some next steps, okay? So let me, let me show you that what, what, what these gifts mean. Number one, the gift of the apostle. And if you've gone through our growth track, we use this test, so you might be familiar with this. Uh, this is my primary gift. Everyone in the room has one of these, okay? If you're a follower of Jesus, he's given gifts for us for a purpose. So the apostle exists. This gift was given to help maintain and develop the sentness of the church. Like there's this, they're, they're kind of the big picture people. Like, so if you're in your city group, the goal is that all of these gifts are present both in your city group and on a weekend gathering and every expression of the church. And all of us together are working together to accomplish what God has for us. And so this is, again, the big picture. Hey, there's a mission, and we're going to plant more churches, Bold of the West and the World, all of that. You guys see it? And this is not a senior leader gift. This, is, this is, happens to be my gift. What's ironic is the gift of pastor or shepherd I don't have, okay? And so I, you know, I could be disqualified from my job if we're using it in that, in that manner, but that's not what these are for. So number one is apostle. You might have this if you've taken the test. Number two uh, um, is going to be prophet. Prophets exist. The gift of prophecy here. It's not a word of prophecy necessarily, but the prophets exist to help, help hear, discern, and communicate God's heart for people and situations with both a vertical focus on holiness and a horizontal focus on justice. 
Prophets are in tune with the heart of God. So think of apostle as in tune with the mission of God. Prophets are in tune with the heart of God. How helpful is it to have a prophet in your corner? Someone who can hear and discern and communicate God's heart for you? Imagine you're in a city group and there's someone that can speak into your life. And in fact, it happens all the time here, by the way, right? And some of you, you have this gift and you lean in and you press in and it's so helpful. Especially when you don't have that gift. You're like, I just need to hear from God. And these people are like, I got you. Next one is evangelist. This is not like door knocking 101, okay? But the gift of evangelist, these people exist, this gift exists in people to help every person in community everywhere have a clear and compelling opportunity to hear the good news and join the family of God. So think of, man, they, they carry God's heart for the lost. So the apostle is big picture mission of God and the evangelist is narrowed in on every individual having the opportunity to join the family of God, to know the love of God. And they're ne- uniquely gifted to kind of have a capacity toward meeting people far from God where they are and helping them understand the good news and walking in that. You guys tracking with me? So some of you have this gift, and you need to lean into it. Here's what I'm telling you. Whatever your gift is, use it for God's glory and the good of others. The next one, shepherd or pastor. So depending on your translation, the the pastor is best translated shepherd. So don't, don't think office or a job title. Think a gift, okay? The shepherd wants to help create and maintain healthy community. By the way, this is a majority of your city group leaders. At least, I think, I was looking this week, at least one, if not every, one of our group leaders has this gift. So one of your group leaders in every group has this gift. And it makes sense because they want to help create and maintain healthy community. Promoting the common good, encouraging people in the faith, guiding people through brokenness back to wholeness and healing, and ensuring the welfare of the people as well as the broader society in which the community abides. That's beautiful, isn't it? So one person's really in tune with the will and heart of God, like like alignment with God and his desires for our lives and justice in the world around us. And then the shepherd's over here caring for people inside the church so we can become the people that Jesus is creating us to be. And the last one is the teacher. To help people, they, they exist to help people gain insight into how God wants them to see and experience the world. They're primarily concerned with worldview. So with the scriptures as the access point into reality, The goal is not information, but formation. To cast a clear and compelling vision for what Jesus has called the good life. So if you've gone through our growth track, you probably heard your gift and you're like, I have no idea how to use it. My goal today is simply to empower you to step into your gifts and to use them to build up the body. So I want you to imagine, I'll give you a story, just the best example. So my primary is gonna be apostle. I think the big picture is how God has wired me. My secondary might be evangelist of her heart for God, the people far from God. And so that's my, my, my focus. So City Church is launching, and all the time, right? Like it's over and over again. I'm talking about like, let's reach people, reach people, more churches, plant. Let's, oh, over and over again, like there's more that God has called us to do. And then one day, Maddie is, is this is way before, like there was like, 20 people in the lobby back in the day, right? And Maddie comes to me, one of our, she does the MC today, one of our staff members, and she says, hey, I'm concerned that, that we are so focused on mission that we are missing out. Like, like we're underserving the people in our church. We're so focused on reaching people that are not here yet that we're underserving the people that are here. And there were two options in this conversation. We're sitting at Starbucks, and, we, and, and I could have said, wow, you're right. I should work on that better. I should try to be better at that. And by the way, just because you're gifted in one area doesn't give you an excuse to be a dirtbag in the others, right? Like, I don't get to not care about people because I'm an apostle. Like, take new ground, screw you guys, right? Like, that's not how it works. So, I have to care, but just like everyone is called to live on mission, to do the work of an evangelist, if you will, to share the good news, just like everyone is called to make disciples, the evangelist is uniquely gifted in that. You guys with me? So we're talking about capacities here. So you have a unique gifting. We have all a general calling from God, but we have a unique gifting. So Maddie comes to me. She's like, hey, I'm concerned. And as she's talking about it, I mean, she's telling all these things that I can, I just have not seen. And I'm like, whoa, and a little overwhelmed. It's outside of my capacity. I didn't even, I'm like, wow, that's a lot. And then it just was really clear. Like the Holy Spirit was like, hey, this is your moment. And so I said, it appears to me that you have the gift of a shepherd. And so you should do those things. And a lot of the health and community that you see here at City Church today is because of people pressing into their giftings rather than hoping that Drake figures it out. If as a church we lean into my gift set alone, we're going to be a lopsided church that maybe continues to take ground, but also there's a lot of hurt people in our wake. But because 
of the holistic nature of this gift set and what Jesus wants to give through you and I and the empowerment of this church together, not just your staff team. This is our volunteers. This is our group leaders. This is just simply your participation in the body. We see these things fleshing out. My goal for you today is to understand a little more deeply who God has made you to be and then really to empower you to start pressing into that. Imagine if you knew how God wired you and you showed up with that particular focus when you were at a city group or in our weekend gatherings, or as you're serving, that you leaned into how God has made you. That's the goal. Um, Let me just give you this quote from Alan Hirsch, just to kind of wrap up that conversation. Oh, sorry, let's go back to the book. So if you you want more, I don't have time today, but if you want more on this conversation, I highly recommend, will you go back, there you go. Uh, Alan Hirsch wrote this book called 5Q, and and it's a great in-depth conversation on what we're talking about today. Uh, Highly recommend it. Um, But here's a quote from that book that I wanted to share with you. He says, the church always needs to, so again, imagine holistically what we're trying to accomplish through that prayer, the mission of God. The church always needs to experience itself as sent, being the prime agent to God's ongoing mission in the world. That's the apostle. It's a little abbreviation. The church should always attend to God and his concerns. That's the prophet, P. Should always share the story and invite people into living relationship. That's the evangelist. Should always maintain and develop healthy community. That's the shepherd and should always be rich in knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. That's the teacher. Check it out. All are needed in every time and in every place. None of us are perfect. This church and family is not perfect, but our desire is to see this empowerment grow more and more through this family. And so what have we covered so far? Number one, God is a giver. That's the motive. Number two, God wants to give you. And lastly, number three, if you want joy, my invitation for you today is to give. Give generously out of the overflow of who God has made you to be. Time, energy, resources, talents, all of it. If you want joy, press into who God has made you to be. You say, how do I do that? Listen, you have natural talents and you have supernatural talents. Your natural talents might be what you're gifted for from birth. Your, Your supernatural talents would be your gifts, if you will, would be what you're gifted from your new birth with Jesus, okay? And so you have both. I don't really care how and what you do with those other than that you use them for God's glory and the good of others. Everything that's in you, leverage it for the kingdom. And so so you might ask the question, well, what's my gift and how do I press into it? Honestly, trial and error is the best way to figure this out. Growth Track gives you a taste of this, but, but it really is in your court to identify who God has made you and then to develop it. Also, you don't just get to sign up. Well, I have the gift of teacher, so I'll be speaking next week, right? It's not really how it works, right? Or like, I have the gift of prophet, so bam, let me just give it a shot and see if I hit it on the X. But the idea is we have to develop these gifts, identify them, grow in them, just like everything else in your life, right? Just because you have an inclination towards sports doesn't mean you can just walk on an NFL field and like do a good job. You get crushed. I'll get crushed anyway. But like some of you, you might actually have what it takes, but you still got to train, And so once you identify your gifts, I just want to encourage you. Oh, and there's a link. I'm sorry. Do you guys have that link? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I skipped it. Yep. So if you you don't remember your results, and you're like trying to remember who, like we have that in our system for you if you're taking growth track, but if you want to retake it, it takes you just a few minutes. Don't do it right now, but you can write down the link, fivefoldministry.com. Fivefoldministry.com. It's a free assessment you can take to see kind of where your top score is, and then you begin to flesh it out, okay? You guys tracking with me? Okay, because we're out of time, um, I'm not going to go to the sweet spot conversation, but I I just want to give you this, because this matters, that everything you and I do that contributes to this overall influences the health of the body and the mission of God and the world around us. I think everything that God wants to accomplish in and through this community, he's going to do when all of us are functioning in our gifting, contributing. Why? Because on my own, I'm going to leave people hurt and unequipped. I was having a conversation with Billy the other day, and he's got that prophet kind of teacher thing going on, and and he's like, hey, what about this and this and this and this and this? And I'm like, wow, those are all really good things that are not on my radar, and the the body is better. And this is not just leadership. It's not like, hey, leverage your gifts and send me an email, right? That's not it at all. It's just go to Citigroup. This week, just imagine you show up at Citigroup and lean into how God has wired you. And again, just because you have a gift doesn't mean we're exempt from the other areas, but I do think you have a sweet spot the intersection of your gifts and your, your talents, if you will, and your passions and your opportunities. And we want you to lean into those. 
So I want to encourage you. If you want joy, give. Give the gift of you to the community around you. And what you're going to do is you're going to find joy and you're going to find purpose. But if you don't give, not only do you miss out on joy, but others miss out on what God created you to uniquely invest. And God has so much more for you and for me and for Boulder, the West, and the world. And so we exist to help people find their way to God from where they are, but that mission hinges on every single person doing their part to build this body up in love, to equip and empower and encourage. If you look around and there are things that burden your heart, it might be that you are uniquely gifted to serve in that area, in and outside of the church. So let's do some action steps. Like how do we, how do we take some next steps here? Number one, I just want to encourage you. If you're not a follower of Jesus, respond to the gift of God's Son. All of this begins in God's love. Not our effort, not our earning, not our performance, not our accolades. Whether you think you've done plenty and God should love you anyway, or you think you're way past gone and there's no way God will love you, neither of those things are true. You and I are separated from God, and Jesus made a way for us to be restored back into relationship with God. And so if you have never responded to the gift of God's Son, it's a gift. We don't earn it. We, de- we don't deserve it. We simply receive it. And in trusting in Jesus and who he said he was and what he could do in our lives, when we trust in him, he changes everything. So it starts there, but it doesn't stop there. This week, if I, if I could encourage you, let intimacy with God be your priority. This is the hardest part of following Jesus, and it's no mistake. Let intimacy with God be your priority, and activity for God will be the overflow. Number three, identify and develop your gifts. Some of you, you're pressing into that wonderfully. Some of you, there's so much more that you could do. And our desire, listen, we don't do it perfectly, but our desire is to see you empowered. You are seen, you are loved, and our desire, both through our city groups and through Growth Track and all those spaces, is to see you empowered, but it doesn't mean we see everything. So whatever it is, identify and develop your gifts, natural, spiritual, all of it. Number four, give your time, talent, energy, and resources to God and his kingdom. In a season of consumerism, let's, con- let's maintain the posture of Jesus' followers, pressing into radical generosity. So show up in your group this week, and as you're partying, leverage who God has made you. Dream about what God is wanting to do in and through you, both in and outside of the church. I was journaling this morning in this space, and as we press into these, we, 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 we're going to find joy. But as I was journaling this morning, it's, it's not just, okay, yeah, God, I'm, we're going to give to the, to the Christmas offering so we can, we can move the mission forward here at City Church, but also, okay, God, you've given us some other people that we can bless financially this Christmas season, our kids' teachers, and what do you want us to do there? And over and over again, resources and time, and okay, I can use my time to help these people over here. I helped Seth and Maddie move yesterday. Best move of my life. They had like three things. It was glorious. <laughs> but there was genuine joy in just helping, right? It's interesting. Find joy, time, talent, energy, and resources in every space. Let's develop that. And lastly, repeat it over and over and over again. This is what it looks like for God to accomplish through this community what he has called us to. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for this incredible community here. Man, they are all so gifted. And I want to see those gifts come to life, used for your kingdom, making a difference in and outside of the church. Everyone in this room has so much more to give than they realize. And so I pray that you set a vision in our hearts for what you want us to do, how you want to use us. Will we find joy and purpose despite our circumstances because of your goodness and your power working through us? I pray for any of my friends in the room who who have never made a decision to trust in you. 
that today they would make the decision to say, Jesus, in their hearts and minds, I, I, I believe that you're the son of God. I believe you died for me to forgive me of sin. You rose again with power to make me new, and I want to follow you. Jesus, anyone in the room that's not currently a follower of you, and I pray that they would accept that gift today and step into new life. And for the rest of us, Holy Spirit, would you speak? We can't do everything, but all of us can do something, and we can probably do more than we think. But we can only do it with your power and with your strength. So would you lead us in that, and will we obey joyfully, knowing it's for your, for your glory, for the good of others, and ultimately for our good. Thank you for your goodness and your love. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.